what you're going to do in advance. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. You can be seated tonight, and uh, I promise I won't make you stand until we're ready to read our text tonight. It's so good to have you in the house of the Lord this evening. Appreciate you being here. going to ask our ushers to go ahead and come this direction. We're going to take up our Sunday school offering, and appreciate dedicated Sunday school staff that continues to work with our children, and uh, they'll be dismissing those classes here for children here in just a little while. The youth class will be dismissed once I get up and ready to preach. And I appreciate your faithfulness to the house of the Lord. We are missing Brother Cannon. He's got one more service where he's working nights. And uh, appreciate him and his leadership here in our music department. So if you can just get by with me tonight, we'll have the good stuff again Sunday. God bless you. Praise God. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to bless this offering. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. I thank you, Lord, for this service that you've given us tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would work in this place. God bless both our offering, Lord, and our worship and praise in this place tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. They're coming to you. Let's worship together tonight. You said if you be lifted, you draw all men to you. You said if you be lifted, you draw all men to you. So draw me, draw me closer. So draw me, Lord, draw me closer to you. I'm going to lift you higher and higher. Oh Lord, I'm gonna lift you up, and I'm never gonna stop. Oh, with everything I've got, I'm gonna lift you up. Oh Lord, I'm gonna lift you up, and I'm never gonna stop. Oh, with everything I've got, I'm gonna lift you up. We've come to worship Him. Would you lift up your voice and praise to the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. You said, if you be lifted, you draw all men to you. You said, if you be lifted, you draw all men to you. So draw me, oh, draw me closer. So draw me, draw me closer to you. I'm going to lift you higher and higher. Oh Lord, I'm gonna lift you up, and I'm never gonna stop. Oh, with everything I've got, I'm gonna lift you up. Oh Lord, I'm gonna lift you up, and I'm never gonna stop. Oh, with everything I've got, I'm gonna lift you up. Oh Lord, I'm gonna lift you up. Yes, I am. Oh, with everything I've got, I'm going to lift you up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, we praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You said, if you be lifted, you draw all men to you. You said, if you be lifted, you draw all men to you. So draw me, draw me closer. Draw me, Lord, draw me closer to you. I'm gonna lift you higher and higher. I'm gonna lift you up. Oh Lord, I'm gonna lift you up. And I'm never gonna stop. Oh, with everything I've got, I'm gonna lift you up. Oh Lord, I'm gonna lift you up. And I'm never gonna stop. Oh, with everything I've got, I'm gonna lift you up. I'm gonna lift my hands. I'm gonna lift my voice. I'm gonna lift my worship to you. I'm gonna lift my hands and give you praise. I'm gonna lift you up. Oh, Lord, I'm gonna lift you up. And I'm never gonna stop Oh, with everything I've got I'm gonna lift you up Oh, Lord, I'm gonna lift you up And I'm never gonna stop Oh, with everything I've got I'm gonna 
this place tonight. Let's take some time and worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Have you come to worship him on this Wednesday night? Let's magnify him together. Jesus, there's none like you, oh God. Hallelujah. Sing our God. Our God, a firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. Oh. Nations rise and fall. So kingdoms, kingdoms, what's strong now shaken? We trust forever in your name. Oh, the, the name, name of Jesus. Jesus. We trust, oh, we trust the name of Jesus. Sing that again. He is our God, oh, our God, a firm foundation. He's our rock. The only solid ground oh, as nations rise and fall. Oh, kingdoms, once strong, now shaken, we trust forever in your name. Oh, the, the name of Jesus. Say we trust, oh. we trust the name of Jesus. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you will reign. Lord, and every knee will bow. Okay, yes, we, we bring our expectations. Our hope is anchored in your name. It's in the name, the name of Jesus. How many are thankful you know in my name tonight? Say, Lord, we trust, yeah, we trust. The name of Jesus. So sing that chorus. You are. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Oh, oh, thank you, Jesus. Sing that verse, unmatched, Lord, you're unmatched. In all your wisdom, in love and justice, you will reign. And every knee will bow. So tonight we bring our expectations. We bring our expectations. Lord, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. Our hope is in how we trust that name. Say, we trust the name of Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. All oh, sing this with us, say, we lift hope. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. Oh, yeah. From age to age you reign, Lord, your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high, we lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign, your 
kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus from age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Oh, give the Lord praise in this house today. Hallelujah. Come on, how many believe he's stronger than anything else? As nations rise and fall, the kingdom of God's going to stand. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That song speaks to right where we are today. There's a lot of talks of peace treaties all around the world and talks of anger and different decisions. But that song says as nations rise and fall, there's one thing that's going to stay the same, and that's the kingdom of God. It's not going to change. What did the Bible say? When Jesus was born, it said, His government, there will be no end. That peace is going to be on His shoulders. He's going to be the one that will actually bring ultimate peace into this world. That's why we tell folks in their life when they come to God and it's all a mess, we tell them, we say, you just need to get God in your life. He's the one that's the Prince of Peace. He can bring that peace into your life. Praise God. Praise God. That's why we give Him glory and we give Him praise. We're worshiping together tonight. Let's worship together. Thank you. Sing with us before before the world was made before you spoke it to be you were the king of kings yeah you were yeah you were and now you're reigning still enthroned above all things angels and saints cry out we join them as we sing glory to god glory to god glory to god forever glory to god glory to god glory to god forever glory to god glory to god glory to god breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days all my days so let my whole life be a blazing offering a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King glory to God glory to God glory to God forever offering a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our king glory to god glory to god glory to god forever glory to god yes glory to god glory to god forever All for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life. Take my life and let it be. All for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life. Take my life and let it be. All for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Oh. 
for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Say glory, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Oh, let's give the Lord praise tonight. Huh? Oh, would you stand to your feet tonight and give the Lord praise all across this house this evening? Let's lift our voice. I believe the Lord's worthy of worship right now. Would you lift your voice and praise Him together? Jesus, we love you. I thank you for your goodness to us, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. All of our classes are dismissed tonight. I couldn't get their attention, so we're just going to dismiss them all at one time this evening. And appreciate you being in the house of the Lord on this Wednesday night. I know there's a lot of sickness. we got some taking vacations and trips and so uh, it's that time of year. So uh, as the kids are getting out of school, people take advantage of that. We've got others that are out of town working tonight. And uh, I know Brother McCoy texted me earlier talking about being out of town working this evening. And uh, appreciate you, though, coming on to the house of the Lord and us spending this time together. We're going to go to Luke chapter 1, continuing in our series of ladies uh, in the Bible, women in the Bible that we can learn lessons from. And uh, tonight's two are a little later on in their years on purpose. Um, I don't believe God shelves anybody, no matter where we are in life. I believe that God uh, is able to use us. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 1, and also we'll read a little bit in Luke chapter 2, I guess. So uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 5, There was in the days of Herod the king of Judah, or Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all of the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. Verse 13, the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Verse 24, After those days, and his wife Elizabeth conceived, and hid herself five months saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among women, among women, or among men, rather. Now, I think it's interesting to know we focus a lot of times on Mary putting, or Joseph putting Mary away. But actually, Elizabeth, she even does the same thing. For five months, she is put away. Both of these girls, there was a reproach that was going to be brought upon them because of this pregnancy that was caused by the Lord. Now, in Luke chapter 2, Verse 36, there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of uh, Penuel of the tribe of Aser. She was of great age, had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of about fourscore and four years, departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So I want to focus tonight on Elizabeth and Anna, both of these ladies. It was older uh, times when the Lord began to deal with them, there is a critical balance from that which is needed and that which is best for the moment. And so we're going to kind of stay in that vein tonight. And I appreciate you standing in honor of the word of the Lord. We'll let you be seated tonight. And uh, I don't know if I will even go as long as I normally do this evening. Uh, it has been a whirlwind uh, around here lately. And so I'm going to do my best with what I've got tonight. Appreciate you being here in the house of the Lord. Anyone who has helped lead a church from 40 to either 700 members and then has even seen it to grow to thousands, deserves to re retire. A person expects even those who have not endured the challenges of such a dynamic ministry to kick back maybe in their golden years and not be consumed so much with the task. However, there's a lady that is still going, and uh, she is up in her years. And when I say her name, every person in this room that, is a, that has uh, been around Pentecost for any time at all will recognize the name, Sister Vesta Mangan. She has not let age stop her from making the continual impact on her world. And after so many decades of dedication, she will continue in fastings and prayers watching for her Savior to appear. And countless souls have been blessed by her fervent praying. Thousands have been touched by her knock on their doors. Millions have been influenced by her impassioned, her impassioned message that she preaches every year at, at because of the times. And it's souls, souls, souls and 
pray, pray, pray. You've, if you've never heard her speak, you don't know what I'm talking about, but if you've ever heard any of her sermons, she will eventually get to that. It's soul, soul, souls, and you got to pray, pray, pray. And, and it's true. With her husband, G.A. Uh, Vestamangan went to Alexandria, Louisiana. It was back in 1950. And through her zealous ministry and later the leadership of their son, who now pastors, Pastor Anthony Mangan, the church experienced several moves into bigger and more improved buildings. Still, one thing could not be approved upon, and that was the sight of a thin, white-haired woman bowed in the altar praying, seeking the face of the Lord and standing in the gap for lost or struggling souls. And like Anna in the New Testament, I bring her up because Sister Mangan has continued a life of prayer and fasting after being widowed. And we all as believers in the Lord ought to follow that example to daily want to be in the presence of God and be quick to introduce uh, him to all who will hear about him. So tonight I want to talk to us about a little different subject and maybe there's a few of us in the room that we may not view ourselves in this category tonight but it's something that maybe will stick with us that when we get to that later on in life that we can glean from this sermon. I want to preach to you tonight with the subject seasoned in faith. Seasoned in faith. Time can be your greatest enemy but it can also be your greatest asset. And with, with time, houses deteriorate. Shingles fall off. Foundations settle. Paint begins to peel. And believe it or not, things just wear out. Time also allows tomatoes to ripen. Thank you, Lord. Apple trees to blossom. Seasons to change. So that same time that deteriorates your house is growing some vegetables and is growing fruit and is doing a good thing. So time is a neutral force that works differently on living beings and also on different on inanimate ob objects. Inanimate objects grow worse with time. I'm talking about houses, cars, um, other inanimate objects, age, uh, break down and become unusable. Uh, generally speaking, living things improve with time to a point. As your kids grow up, they begin to learn certain patterns of behavior and they improve. As age in humans does not have to be a negative thing as long as the living water flows within. And so we don't have to worry about time as we grow older um, because as long as we know we're right with the Lord, whenever that time comes for us to leave this life, um, we're ready to meet Him. So we don't worry about those things. Even the young can become the living dead if we stop dreaming, if we stop hoping, if we stop praying or growing. And so our focuses and purposes has changed throughout our life. I'm finding that even in my own life, the older I get, my focus seems like it's a little different than it used to be. Uh, each individual's life begins to take on meaning. Rather than wearing yourself out by looking back to what should have or could have been, I, I don't know about you, Brother John, but I used to sit back and I used to think, well, you know what, if this day would have went like this, I could have got X, Y, and Z done. What I was doing right there did absolutely no good. And I would frustrate myself. And, 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 and I have learned that now instead of looking at back what it should have been or what could have been, every child of God ought to live in the moment that God wants life for us to be in right here and right now. And so wherever we are in our age and in our life, we ought to be focusing our energies upon where God has us. Retirement is a time to reflect and refocus priorities. It does not mean that individuals have finished pursuing their life's purpose. Uh, there was a radio guy in Jackson. He just retired, and his simple reason for retiring was not that he couldn't get up and go to work anymore. It was he's got an RV sitting in his backyard that he just wanted to take off and drive and enjoy the country. It wasn't a time for him to sit back and quit pursuing a purpose. He had a purpose in his life. However, the method of making life meaningful changes as we get older. You know, um, I, I can remember... As a kid, you know, I had that real high voice until puberty finally hit. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, I, I got tired of people calling the house and then, then thinking they were talking to Sister Wilkerson. And, and uh, so finally I quit answering the phones and my voice changed. And, uh, but it, it, but I, I remember the older I got, we would go and sing somewhere. And, you know, there were times where Dad would get behind and we wouldn't get there in time to do a mic check and, and, and sing or we didn't have time to practice. And so Mom would hit that key and we'd get started. And I'm like, oh, Mom, my voice has changed. I can't hit that like I used to. Uh, my voice is lowering. Um, Mom, Mom tells me that, that the older she has gotten, they've even had to start changing some of their keys because there's certain keys they used to sing in. Her voice now will crack and, and it won't carry that tune. 
Preachers may, may be spent. They may not have the energy to expound the word of God as they once did. Fortunately, life is not about personal fulfillment. Retirees can find meaning. They can find purpose in these premium years by investing in others. So rather than becoming like a stagnant pond, elders in God can keep a constant inflow of the spring of life and outflow into others' lives. One day as Zacharias was going about his priestly duties, I'm going to take you to our text tonight, the angel Gabriel suddenly appears to him to announce that, hey, hey man, your prayers have been answered and the answer is on its way. And Zacharias had settled into the daily routine of life. Perhaps he was even given hope that at his advanced age, the prayer for a child, would, would, would he, he may have given up that hope that it would ever be answered. But God had bigger plans for him. Yes, even in his golden years, God was going to come through with his promise. And Gabriel makes this abrupt entrance into Mary's life. And, and as well as Zacharias's, and she was not expecting to be expecting either. And then again, neither was Elizabeth, Zechariah's wife. And so if Zechariah and Elizabeth were over the hill, Mary had just begun to climb the hill. And Zechariah and Mary, they're both shocked to hear the angel's announcement of this unplanned pregnancy. And the young woman's amazement became wonder-filled belief as Zechariah, uh, he would gape in, in kind of a disbelief. You know, I would have to put myself in his shoes and understand why he panicked. As an older man, he had entered the quiet, predictable confines of the temple. And while he's standing before the golden altar, the Bible actually tells us he became visibly shaken when the angel Gabriel appears to him. Zechariah standing there in a silent fear. Don't be afraid, Zechariah, Gabriel would say. And Zechariah was not instantly overwhelmed with relief, even though he knew it was an angel. Because he, he, but, but he was paying close attention. And the angel says, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you're going to name him John. And Gabriel continues to express how wonderful this event would be. What joy, what meaning the child would bring to the man and his wife, and how this little life would turn the hearts of many people toward the Messiah. It appears that Zacharias had given up hope early in marriage. I have to believe this young couple were a hopeful young couple looking forward to children blessing their home. Zechariah especially wanted a son. You know, all these men, they want a son. And, and years and then decades would go by. Not only did he not have a son, he didn't have a daughter. There was no children. And when God brought the answer he sought, Zechariah was no longer asking for it. I'm sorry, Zechariah, I can hear him tell the angel. You'll have to confirm this to me somehow. My wife and I are well past the age of having children. Yeah, the common sense tells you it's not going to happen. And Gabriel then would give him a sign. He struck the dumbstruck man speechless. He would be unable to talk until the promise came to pass. Sometimes we humans are guilty of looking at the glass as half empty rather than half full. And Zechariah stood before the golden altar. I want you to look at this. He is in an area that nobody else can go. He is standing at the golden altar inside the temple. Very few men could stand there. There was no reason for him to be negative about his usefulness in life. Outside, there's a large crowd of people that are praying and they are waiting for him to come back and give them a blessing. Too often, as we get older, our age-related difficulties and setbacks can cause us to see life in a dim view rather than the hope-filled perspective the Lord has. It's, it's kind of like these new converts in Christ when they come to church, and some of us that have been in it a while, if we're not careful, we'll pour water on their fire. You know, and, and sometimes our experience and our experiences in life are not really good for us because we see, sometimes we use that to damper somebody else's hopes and dreams. No matter uh, what our age may be, it is not an excuse for God to not use us. Just because maybe our bodies have aged doesn't mean that we're past the season of working in the kingdom of God. God is not done with people even when society says you're past your prime. Just because medical science says when you get to a certain age... You can sit there and say it ain't that way, but I've seen it happen too often. When you get to a certain age, it's almost like medical science says we're limited in what we can do for you now. We're, we're not going to go what we would do for a 20-year-old person. And so as you get to a certain age, it almost feels like society pushes you away and makes you feel like you're not useful. 
My purpose in this sermon tonight is to show you there's two people later on in their life where God had made promises for them and they had not seen it fulfilled yet, but in their golden years, God came through to them. I'm trying to minister to some senior saints in this building tonight. Don't give up on the promises of God. When he gives you a promise, it doesn't matter what age I've got on my birth certificate, God is going to come through with his promises. Amen. And yes, we've seen some things happen. You know, John Wesley, I, I was looking at this today. I found a lot of stats tonight. And John Wesley, he wrote thousands of personal letters. He preached over 40,000 times. He wrote a Bible commentary. He traveled almost a quarter of a million miles on horseback. These accomplishments can intimidate some of us that are the busiest, you know, even in the kingdom of God, because I don't, I don't know if we'll ever attain that. Not everyone will be a super producer or an overachiever. However, every child has to be busy in the kingdom of God. John Wesley was busy for the Lord, and he didn't even get started till his mid-30s, and it went all the way until his late 80s. Now, I said that to say this. Compare this life with another familiar name, George Mueller. He traveled just as many miles as John Wesley, and many of those miles were by boat, I would add. His preaching reached millions of people. What's the difference between the two men? Muller did not accept his call to preach till he was 70 years old. All right, Fanny Crosby, we sing a lot of her songs or sing them. She found her life's purpose at age 43 when she wrote her first song that brought glory to the Lord. And songs began to flow out of Fanny Crosby's heart. And from this woman, it was in such an abundance, nobody knows really how many songs she wrote. But it's estimated to be between eight and 9,000. And she didn't even start until she was 43. Why do you say that? Because age is not a determining factor of when or how we can work for God. As long as our mental capacity is there, there is somewhere for the Lord to be able to use you. So I'm just endeavoring to challenge all of us. No matter our age and season of life that we are in, there is a job for us to do in the kingdom of God. He wants us to be busy in the Father's business. And so we can be seasoned in the faith. So it's a lot of times our life, uh, our, our world will call it, you know, these are seasoned people. They're, they'll even in these churches. Church growth conferences talk about seasoned saints and how they've been in there for a while and they know uh, the ups and downs of life and they're those seasoned saints. They're those foundational families. There are three phases of life uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 5 where Paul would applaud young Timothy's faith which came to him by, his, uh, by way of his mother, which was Eunice, his grandmother Lois. We could view life in 30-year increments, if you will. If we were fortunate enough to live nine decades. Knowing which face that we are in will help us better relate to the two others. In other words, the first 30 years of life are considered a season of preparation. Children grow into adults. They learn. They go to college. They study. They get a good grasp on the facts of living in those first 30 years. And it's during this time that they ought to develop a close walk with God. It's just as foundational for them to learn the things of God as it is to go to school and learn the things of the world. And so those in this first 30-year age group ought to settle on a life focus and study. They ought to find out what they're going to do for a career in their lives and apply themselves to learn that career. So they say after that 30-year mark, people often are doing what will be the major focus of their life. Children of God will often have found their niche in ministry, if you will. They found their life purpose. And this is the time to make a mark on the world, to contribute skills and innovation that make the world a better place. You've got that energy still. Individuals would hope to contribute 30 or more years to productive service. And then by age 60, a person has reached what some view as the golden years. And some view that as a time to relax or to retire or to kick back and enjoy while for the most part, the workload at 60 should not be what it was at 30. Perhaps a new perspective will help us to not see ourselves as over the hill. I know that sounds so negative the way people put that today. This last third of our lives is basically a time to reinvest in those who are preparing. By this time, we've got a better perspective. I, I'm thankful. When I, when I was first elected pastor and uh, 
I'll, I'll be honest with you, he wasn't too sure about it, to be honest with you. Brother Miller uh, came and met with me on the side, and, and, and he talked to me. He said, man, I'm just really concerned. But he said, I, I, I'm praying for you, and I want to give you some wisdom. I said, man, sit down. I want to hear from you. I want you to talk to me. You've been through this. And he started pastoring at a young age. And he said, well, here's what I went through at your age. And I was able to glean. He was in that last third of his life. He was in that 60 up range. And, 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 and I was able to sit there in my preparation stage at a 21 year old young man to glean from a guy that's been there before I don't believe our young people ought to have to make the same mistakes that our elders have made but we can't expect them just to know those things matter of fact in the scriptures and I think I'm going to go there in just a minute where he even commands the older women to teach the younger women we're losing that today we're losing that because we feel like we're out of touch we're not connected. No, 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 no. If you start speaking to those, I'm finding more and more young people today want to hear from that elder generation. And so by this time, you've got some experience. You've got some observations. You know what? What we may think is something new. I never will forget it. I called Dad all excited about something new I was going to present to the church. And he said, hey, Seth, we tried that once. Oh, really? How'd that go? When he told me? I decided not to do it because he had observed that once before. And he said, here's what you're going to have to do. Now, there was another time I called him. He said, hey, I'm not telling you don't do this, but here's what happened before. Here's what you need to try to avoid. Here's the pitfalls. And we went on and, and did the new endeavor, but I was able to use the observations and experience of a former pastor to be able to navigate through a very sensitive area. Mature people have wisdom. And you've got insight in God that is going to help a younger generation in a classroom across the hallway to clearly miss some obstacles that they would not have missed without your instruction. See, I like this. Senior citizens should see that their time is not over even when your strength has begun to fade. Let me tell you something. There's some of you, your faithfulness inspires me. It inspires me. Because I know what kind of effort it takes for you to get to the house of God. Your faith and your faithfulness make them into priceless treasures in the kingdom of God for the younger generation to look to. You're too old, the mission board told a lady who wanted to serve overseas. God, who does not count time as we do, thought otherwise, and soon she was on her way to do a work for God. Let me stop right there and say, neither did Elizabeth consider herself too old to serve when, when the Lord called her, she simply said, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take my, away my reproach among men. So following the spirit of Elizabeth and borrowing her name, Elisa George persisted as a missionary in Liberia, as a UPCI missionary, even when our missions board said, you got to retire at 65. So you know what she did, Sister Barbara? She came back and found her own supporters. And she continued to serve in her field of calling for nearly 30 more years. What? An, and our mission board learned their lesson. They quit telling people when to retire. Because they said, man, this lady went back and really did a work for God. She was up in her 80s when she finally uh, quickly, uh, you know, she, she quickly started learning, I can't do this, you know, anymore. So to quickly look at the two ladies we're focusing on from Scripture tonight, we got a note. There was no spotlight on Elizabeth until she reached her golden years. You won't, you won't read about her until she's older. However, there is something really important about her life than just that moment to shine event. The Bible says she and her husband were righteous before God. So before the spotlight ever hit her, she was righteous with God. She was blameless, the Bible says. So while doing... Dramatic works for the Lord seems like great stories to post on Facebook. The daily and consistent life of somebody that is sold out to the Lord is of much greater value. It's not all about the big splash. Elizabeth was ready to accept what the Lord brought her way, even if her body was surprised by the sudden change. You know, many have a call from God in their youth that they're unable to fulfill until their later years. I think about another lady who went to the mission field. And there was a whole lot of ladies back early, early on that went. And that was simply because when you looked around our churches, there wasn't very many men to start with. We were talking about this earlier today. And uh, thankfully that has changed. But Margaret Cole, she was a woman 
who wanted to go to the mission field the day she was baptized as a teenager. She finally made the trip at age 71 after living a full life and burying her husband. She traveled throughout the eastern hemisphere and enjoyed more adventure and usefulness in just a few years that most people experience in a lifetime. Maud Carey, she opened a work in Morocco at the age of 72. Evelyn Brand lived as a missionary in India long after her missionary husband passed away. By age 75, she was practically too old for the demands of outreach. She fell, she broke her hip, had to endure a trip down a mountain on a stretcher, and then bounced 150 miles on a horse to a care facility with a broken hip. And she had to try to recover without our modern conveniences we have. And she began to walk in with canes and she rode a pony for transportation. Despite her difficulties, she labored on for nearly two more decades, fighting through tropical diseases and muscling her way through more injuries from falling off her mount. And at the age of 93, she relented from trying to ride horseback and let the loyal villages carry her from place to place on a stretcher. And she did this for two more years. And she passed away on the mission field at age 95. Elizabeth in scripture cared about other people. Rather than letting her lack of a child and the lack of what she thought should have happened early on in life turn into bitterness, she said, you know what, I'm going to let life's valley soften me and not harden me toward God. Her gentleness appears in her response to the Lord's gift of a late in life child and her thankfulness to him for this surprise. Elizabeth did not manifest good character just toward her own child, but she cared about others. And I say that because when Mary came to her, Still stunned by her own good fortune, Elizabeth receives her joyfully, even though Elizabeth was entering her third trimester of pregnancy by this point. Mary must have faced a social backlash for being pregnant without yet being married. And Elizabeth provided a safe harbor for this teen who also lived for God with all her heart. And Elizabeth was in tune with the Lord, and she responded in the Spirit with joy at what he was doing in her young cousin. So Mary and Elizabeth, they had a lot to share in their circumstances. They both had unplanned pregnancies. Elizabeth thought she was past being able, and Mary, she, she really didn't think it was yet time, but the Holy Ghost had a different story. And Elizabeth could have done something like, like some older folks who maybe sometimes get too focused on their own experiences and obsess about finding someone to listen to their stories. You know, sometimes, as an older generation, you have to learn how to give back and invest in a younger generation. And so by doing so, she not only encouraged Mary, but Elizabeth also became one of the first to know about God's miracle in this young life. And so while it's comforting and encouraging to share our own experiences with others, investing in the next generation also opens our eyes to what God is doing in this generation. Don't get so focused on what God did yesterday that we forget God's moving in this generation today. And so I want to speak to this older generation and I encourage you, find a Mary. Find a younger person and invest in them. Celebrate their victories while at the same time encourage them there are new heights for you to reach in God. You're going to be able to do things I could not do. Praise God. You know, it's, it's not like wanting this generation to fail, folks. Because if this generation fails, we've all failed. We want this generation to make it. We want them to carry on this banner of truth. And so both Anna and Simeon I want to take you to them real quick. Both Anna and Simeon, they, they were awaiting the coming Messiah. Anna has given her life to serving the Lord, and in her wrinkled and silver-streaked years, she still longed to see the Lord and live. For, she lived really for little else. The Bible says Anna was of a great age. Any age when one serves the Lord is not over the hill or outdated. Every elderly person in the Lord should feel we've reached a great age. While society intimidates the elders into dyeing their hair gray due to the relentless march of time, God's people ought to realize that white and gray hairdos are the crown of our glory. Say, well, I'm not going to dye it. I'm going to pull it out. Well, you're still hiding that crown of glory. Proverbs 16, verse 31. You got that scripture? I think I sent it to you. Proverbs 16 and 31. If you don't have it, I think it says the hoary gray head is a crown of glory. There it goes. If it be found in the way of righteousness. So that's why they want to hide it out there. Because it wasn't found in the way of righteousness. It shows the hard life they lived. The trouble that they went through. But to be gray, doing the work of God is better than the alternative. That's what the verse is telling us here. And so we find that Anna, in her great age is seeking to dwell in the presence of God. 
For her, this meant, I'm going to stay in the temple precincts. Today, we don't find him only in a building made with men's hands. We find him in prayer and in a keeping a worshipful spirit throughout our day. Even though a person, we may not have as much energy to give in the golden years, we still have a lot to contribute to the kingdom. Anna served the Lord, the Bible says, with fasting and prayer day and night. What a powerhouse elderly people are in the Lord when they can pray deep, mountain-moving prayers. And so Anna, she did not pray in the temple because that was how she was raised she was actually of a northern tribe and she according to scripture and and according to what i can find even in history she may have not even seen the temple in her childhood but at 84 years of old we do or age rather we know she loved the lord with all her heart and sought to see his kingdom come and so this one 84 year old woman joins her 82 year old sister in prayer and fasting I want to tell you a story about two older ladies. This one 84-year-old woman joins her 82-year-old sister in prayer and fasting. These two ladies' names are Peggy and Christine. They were crippled. They were blind, respectively, in their age. They prayed in the historic revival in the Scottish Hebrides. And in her later years, Maud Wilkins would testify to the secret of the vibrant elderly years. I'm going to read you what she wrote in, in a book. Mary Wallace wrote this in Pioneer Pentecostal Women, Volume 1. Fasting and prayer, those are the keys. She said, our people eat too much nowadays and they think too much of themselves. Well, I learned early that to be successful in the ministry required hours of prayer, like four hours a day, and days of fasting, like three days of fasting, eat one meal and three more days of fasting. The flesh must be willing to suffer in order to see sons and daughters born into the kingdom of God. Pause right there. The Bible actually says, when you travail, that's when children are born. So she's in the word. She said, one must be unafraid to suffer hunger pains for his glory. It was during these times that I was overshadowed by the mighty power of God and was protected from all evil forces. Yes, she said, fasting and prayer are the keys and don't you ever forget it. You know, Anna did not think her age actually entitled her to anything. Instead, she said, you know what? I am just overwhelmed with the gratitude of what the Lord has allowed me to experience. And she stops and she gives thanks to the Lord that she had the opportunity to see Christ when he arrived at the temple. And she then would tell others about him. Even when she saw him at the temple, she didn't just stop there. She began to tell people, Jesus is here. Oh, that all of God's children, whether of great age or young, we would pray and tell everybody about him until he shows up in our city and in a mighty way. Even an elderly lady can have some spunk. Jewel Foss was invested in the work of God in Houston until the end of her life. And when the congregation outgrew the church building of Greater Bethel Tabernacle, she joined the younger people in helping to raise funds for a new building. And in the book, What If God Wrought, it said this consisted of this elderly lady sponsoring a march from the old church site to the new one. And Jewel got her sponsors, and at an older age, at 78 years of age, be doing the work of the Lord, she marched with those young people seven miles at 78. I imagine you felt that one the next morning. Man, I'll tell you what, I can walk two miles and feel it. My goodness. I'm saying all that to say this. When there's a desire, God provides a way. Unquestionably, folks, we can do great things for God no matter what our age is. Not until she was in her 60s did Carrie Eastridge do a great work with God in Africa by starting churches in new places. I think of Oma Ellis. That may be another name that some of you that have read these books have heard of. Over 60 when she took the pastorate of a church in Arizona and served in the Arizona district. Um, after taking the pastorate, she experienced divine healing of breast cancer after that. It was just an amazing story. Even in cultures, back then even, when the voice of a woman was not usually respected, people would often listen to an older woman out of respect. So that's why many of those women at 60, 70, and 80 years old was able to do a great work of God because they had to really wait until they got to that point for people to listen to them. It was the age, it was the culture that they were in. God still wants to heal and deliver and save the young and the old. I believe that. Lucille Farmer, she told of a 125-year-old man in Ecuador whose family members carried on a stretcher to hear the Acts 238 message. Now that's an old man right there. I don't know if that's like a fishing story or not, but 125, that's an old man. And at the word of the preacher, she says this now, the man gets strength enough to stand, 
And he walks down to the waters of baptism, and when he was baptized, he received the Spirit of God speaking in tongues, and in two days he died. No matter what your age is, where there's a desire, God makes a way. So I'm wrapping things up tonight. I want to say this. The temptation as we get older is to look back and think of bygone days. But by the grace of God, let's keep focusing on today. Because it is a matter of seeing through God's eyes rather than even just sometimes as our vision would fade. At the same time, let's don't obsess with the future. Forget about today. You know, I see a lot of young people today talk about the future. Well, what are you doing right now? They can't answer that question. Um, It's still as unknown now as it was during childhood. The future I'm talking about. But rather than us fear what will come even after we're gone, children of God invest in that next generation so that there's a rich heritage that will continue. And I I say this a lot to our young people. Don't don't build a walk with God from scratch when you can build a walk with God from a legacy your elders have left you with. Glean from what they can tell you. And And this requires a commitment from both sides. It requires a commitment from the elders to make that effort to give back. And it also requires the youth to value listening and asking questions and drawing from that wealth of wisdom. The kingdom of God, the godly older women were taught, and I told you I was going to get here, to teach the young women how to be guardians at home, to be good wives and mothers and examples of individuals with strong morals. I want us to read one more passage tonight in closing, looking at the book of Titus. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. And then it goes on to say the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient in their own hus- to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And then it says, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Although... Humans, we, we learn as kids to mimic the behavior of our parents. Your kids don't learn to say thank you until you say thank you. Today, uh, I think Matthew kind of scared the babysitter. He, he, he gagged on some food. She thought he might have a virus, so she called me. She said, come pick him up. So I picked him up about noon. We ran to the doctor for them to look at me crazy and say, no, he ain't sick, man. You're just... He's a kid. He probably put too much in his mouth. I said, that's all right. I'm doing it for the sake of mom having a, a, a easing of the mind. I said, that's a cheap price to pay, $25 copay. Let's just do that. And then I can go home and say, doctor said everything's okay, you know. So we get back home, and the, other, the, the babysitter was scared to feed him anything else because he, he had choked and that kind of thing. And so we get home, and he starts saying, cracker, cracker. I said, okay. And every time I'd hand him a cracker, he'd go, thank you. And he'd walk off. He'd come back. And Thank you. And I thought, okay, he's learning that. Now he needs to know what to say after you say thank you. So I start saying, you're welcome. I think I confused him because then he'd come back and he'd get a cracker and he'd go, you're welcome. He'd walk off. (laughs) Your kids mimic you. Come on, you know me as a kid. I'd watch some people shout. And then as a kid... I would mimic that. I've watched my own kids to notice that some people would lift their hands and then they would start lifting their hands. Why? Because we learn things by watching. We mimic what we see. Children, youth, and new believers need godly people to observe and imitate. You say, well, that's not a walk with God. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And we say, well, they ain't got full truth. You let them keep dipping their toes in the water, honey, and they're going to get in. I'm just thankful they're coming. There's a whole lot of people that ain't coming. So the more they come around, the more they may get involved. Say, well, they were dancing and it wasn't in the Spirit. Well, you know what? They keep dancing long enough, the Spirit's going to hit that. And they're going to have to decide. Do I want this or not? They're going to have to make a decision at that point. I've I've been a part of it where kids would start playing church and the Spirit of God move in. Then at that point, it it better not be playing church. 
you entertain that. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, is we need godly influences to imitate in our lives. We need to say, you know what, if so-and-so gets up in the morning and they pray, it might ought to be a good thing for me to get up in the morning and spend a little time in prayer. If I know prayerfully and committed youth develop in an environment of prayerfully committed adults. That's how it happens. Elisha became a powerful man of God because of a rough old man named Elijah. Elijah wasn't an easy man to follow. He was all over the place. And he said, I want a double portion. He said, well, son, if you're here with me, when I leave, you'll get that double portion. And then it was almost like he made it as hard as he could on the young man. He went from place to place to place to place. And then all these people trying to stop him. He was a busy one. Prayer and faith are not easy to learn. And I'm going to tell you, you won't learn them from just books. When Elisha was on his own after Elijah was gone, he heard from God about the enemy's plans and warned his nation. The enemy decided, I'm going to take out the man of God. And when the invading army came to town, Elisha wasn't worried, but his understudy was. And so Elisha says, oh God, open this young man's eyes. And suddenly the man saw the armies of the Lord who were on their side. He wouldn't have saw that had an older man not stepped in his life and said, oh God, open his eyes. I'm going to say this, all young ministers and believers need an Elisha who can see God at work when nobody else can. We need older people with a spiritual vision that will give insight and direction to people that are blinded by fear today. A child of God needs to find a faith-filled mentor. And then once you've found one and you grow and you get to that stage in your life, become one. Find somebody you can pour into. So... We're getting ready to close tonight. I'm going to say this in closing. Growing old cannot be all that bad. Everybody's doing it. When others say you're too old, we've got to have the mindset God's older than we are and He's still able to work. So age and strength may limit what a child of God can do. I understand that. I miss those days where Brother Clinny... I, I never was... I wasn't, I wasn't really aware in the time where Brother Clinty would run the aisles, Brother White. I don't remember that as a kid. I remember him telling me one night he got so dancing in the spirit he ran through a wall down there at Mitchell Street. I never did experience that. But I do have memories of Brother Clinty walking across the front, hands shaking and worshiping. I remember in this building him coming and sitting. I believe it was right back in this area. And he couldn't stand any longer, but he'd sit there and he'd shake in his seat. And he would worship and praise God. And I, I would watch. And that, that, that memory still is there with me. The last time I went to see Nima, we would even talk about his worship and how that it had made even an impact in her mind. There is no greater contribution to a church than to be a person of prayer and knowledgeable, commanding in the spiritual realm when you go to pray. No matter how old children of God get, God still has a plan for our life. Every Paul needs to raise up a Timothy. Every John Mark needs a Barnabas and Simon Peter to speak into his life. Every Joshua wants to be affected by Moses' prayer life. Every life must grow spiritually tall enough to overshadow somebody else. And so this is the day of non-traditional students and and second career professionals. And in the kingdom of God, we don't want to retire. We simply want to recycle. In other words, we ought to put our life experiences to the best use that we can. And that is by teaching others and setting an example for that next generation. This generation depends upon the former generation. We've talked about it before. The Bible talks about how that... There was a generation that knew not God, but when you go back and you study that, it wasn't that current generation's fault. There was a generation that experienced the move of God. Then there was a generation that just talked about the experiences of God. And then there came the generation that didn't even talk about it. They didn't even know it. We are one generation away from that if we're not careful. If we're not careful, we can be happy just talking about how good it used to be and not experience it right now. Folks, if our young people don't experience it today, they're not going to carry it to the next generation. And so we rely upon those elders. Oh, I'm thankful that when I needed God to make a way, He made a way. I could still testify even as a young man 
just like you can as an older generation, that says, hey, when I needed him the most, God provided. Would you stand with me tonight and let's thank the Lord for his goodness to us and that he is a very faithful God to us. Jesus, we love you today, God. I thank you for your faithfulness, oh God. We used to sing about it. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning to morning, God, I see your goodness. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just sing this song of thanksgiving together. It says, Jesus, I want to thank you for being so good to me. Jesus, I want to thank you for giving me the victory. You made a way out of no way. You turned my darkness into day. Oh, Jesus, I want to thank you for being so good to me. Sing it together. Say, oh, Jesus, I want to thank you for being so good to me. Jesus, I want to thank you for giving me the victory. You made. 